News at 10 with Trevor MacDonald. Welcome back. The rioting against President Suharto's rule in Indonesia intensified today, fueled by grief for the six students shot dead yesterday. Thousands were back on the streets, defying and fighting police and troops. At least 10 demonstrators were wounded today. Our Asia correspondent Mark Austin reports from the Indonesian capital, Jakarta. On the streets of Jakarta, the fires of protest are burning. This was the reaction today to the killing of unarmed student demonstrators by the security forces of a regime fast losing control here. We witnessed mile after mile of looting and rioting, which continued for hours and which the police and the army seemed unable to prevent. There are now burning barricades and there's widespread looting and rioting across this area of Jakarta. It's quite clear these students won't be giving up until an aging dictator steps down. But much of the rioting was carried out by disenchanted youths who've hijacked the students' cause. At one stage, protesters commandeered a truck and drove it straight at the police line. Earlier, hundreds had gathered for the funerals of those gunned down yesterday. But on the streets, the mourning turned to anger and violence. The students hurled rocks and missiles at police, who again fired back. And again, the bullets were aimed directly into the crowd. The injured were treated at a makeshift medical center on the university campus. By now, riot police were descending on trouble spots as they fled up across Jakarta. In many areas, it was a day of anarchy. And what is awaited now is the response of President Suharto, who remains out of the country during the worst crisis of his 32-year rule. Mark Austin, News at 10, Jakarta. A third day of rioting against President Suharto's rule in Indonesia left much of the capital in flames today. Tanks and armoured cars were out, but there were signs that some troops were beginning to side with the demonstrators. President Suharto cut short a foreign trip and is due to arrive home any moment now. Indonesia is the fourth biggest country in the world in population terms, with nearly 200 million people on a chain of thousands of islands. With the latest from the capital, Jakarta, here's our Asia correspondent, Mark Austin. Tonight in Jakarta, entire streets are in flames, testimony to a day that may change this country forever. A day when the city was abandoned to angry mobs bent on destruction. These are people seething with hatred for a dictator who after ruling Indonesia for more than 30 years now finds his grip on power diminishing by the hour. It's an explosion of violence sparked by an economic crisis that's brought massive unemployment and rampant inflation. Food and fuel prices have jumped by 70%. We are people so poor, you know? We are so poor and the government... The government not care with us with our people. And their targets were symbols of President Zahato's rule. A bank owned by his daughter was attacked, ransacked and looted. And this is a showroom of a car company owned by his son. And the wealthy Chinese population of this predominantly Muslim country are also being targeted. Six were burnt to death in this house rather than face the mob outside. And so for the third day running, the army and the police are completely unable to stop this rioting and looting. It's another day of anarchy on the streets of Jakarta. The Indonesian military moved in with a show of force they were unwilling to use. Today, these guns were to stay silent. Some soldiers meted out punishment of a kind. But there was no shooting when the much-feared riot squad tried to scatter one rampaging mob. And this may be a significant turning point. Suddenly, they appeared to be siding with the protesters. These are images President Suharto will not want to see. The loyalty of the men who have underpinned his 30-year rule may now be called into question. And as a worried president returns from Egypt, Jakarta continues to burn. This is one of the city's biggest shopping centers. And here, the looting was frenzied. On the road leading from it, thousands carried away the spoils of chaos luxury goods they could never dream of buying. Some looters were trapped in the buildings they burnt. 
These are extraordinary scenes here. This is just one of several shopping malls being looted by the rioters. It's becoming difficult not to conclude that these are the death throes of the Suharto regime. If he wants to cling to power, he may order a bloody crackdown. But tonight, this doesn't look like an army about to turn on its people. Mark Austin News at 10, Jakarta. British and other foreign residents fled the anarchy of Indonesia today as the cost of four days of violence continued to mount. It's now thought 200 people may have died in fires started by the rioters. President Suharto has ordered the army back on the streets, but his position remains perilous. Our Asia correspondent Mark Austin reports. This evening in Jakarta, the army are back in control of the streets. But if the rioting and the looting has subsided, for now at least, the political pressure on President Suharto continues to grow. It was the day the army emerged from the shadows to try and regain control of Jakarta, a city which for 48 hours had been surrendered to the mob. These looters had been plundering at will, but today there was summary and painful justice. Throughout the city, the army deployed its military might. It was a show of force that deterred today, but one which raises the spectre of a bloody crackdown if the riots erupt again. For the time being, the crackdown amounts to the rounding up of hundreds of rioters and looters. Some were led away carrying their spoils to be used as evidence against them. Elsewhere, the people weaved their way through the debris of the mayhem. In many places, the fires still rage, and from a burnt-out supermarket came a stark reminder of the human cost of these riots. In here, about 200 charred bodies were found, mainly looters trapped inside, but also some innocent staff trying to protect the property. And there are reports tonight that up to 300 more bodies could be discovered when another shopping centre fire is finally put out. Other victims of the unrest include many Indonesian Chinese targeted because of their wealth. Today we visited what was left of Chinatown and heard of the terror of those who fear for their lives. If not stay here, we can't stay here anymore. There's no guarantee for life. It's too dangerous now. Yeah. It was to this capital in ruins that President Suharto rushed home today, now facing the worst crisis of his 30-year rule. He must decide whether to order a brutal crackdown. His problem is that even some members of his own political party are now openly calling on him to go. And these are the people who are going. Thousands of expatriates, including Britons, are fleeing Indonesia. The Americans are evacuating their citizens, fearing further carnage. But if President Suharto does give the order to crush the unrest, there's no guarantee the army will agree. The country's top general says he favours persuasion rather than repression. Tonight, what Indonesia and the rest of the world are waiting for is the next step by a beleaguered president. Will he try desperately to cling on to power, or will he, as many are insisting, decide finally to step down? Mark Austin, News at 10, Jakarta. Welcome back. The rioting against President Suharto's rule in Indonesia intensified today, fueled by grief for the six students shot dead yesterday. Thousands were back on the streets, defying and fighting police and troops. At least 10 demonstrators were wounded today. Our Asia correspondent Mark Austin reports from the Indonesian capital, Jakarta. On the streets of Jakarta, the fires of protest are burning. This was the reaction today to the killing of unarmed student demonstrators by the security forces of a regime fast losing control here. We witnessed mile after mile of looting and rioting, which continued for hours and which the police and the army seemed unable to prevent. There are now burning barricades and there's widespread looting and rioting across this area of Jakarta. It's quite clear these students won't be giving up until an aging dictator steps down. But much of the rioting was carried out by disenchanted youths who've hijacked the students' cause. At one stage, protesters commandeered a truck and drove it straight at the police lines. Earlier, hundreds had gathered for the funerals of those gunned down yesterday. But on the streets, the mourning turned to anger and violence. The students hurled rocks and missiles at police, who again fired back. And again, the bullets were aimed directly into the crowd. <laughs> 
The injured were treated at a makeshift medical centre on the university campus. By now, riot police were descending on trouble spots as they flared up across Jakarta. In many areas, it was a day of anarchy, and what is awaited now is the response of President Suharto, who remains out of the country during the worst crisis of his 32-year rule. Mark Austin, News at 10, Jakarta. Up to a million people are expected on the streets of Jakarta in Indonesia tomorrow in the biggest demonstration yet against President Suharto's rule. Today, he promised reforms in new elections and said he wouldn't stand again. But that wasn't enough for his opponents, who were swarming all over the Indonesian parliament. They said he should go now, as our Asia correspondent Mark Austin reports from Jakarta. The students of Indonesia are still occupying the country's parliament tonight, on the eve of the biggest protest yet against the increasingly fragile rule of President Suharto. Jakarta is a city preparing for a new turmoil. The army have warned the students to back off from their mass action, but today, in defiance, they completed their takeover of the assembly, taking to the roof with banners calling for the downfall of Suharto, and even to the corridors of the building where the president has not been challenged for three decades. Like a man who knows the game is up, the beleaguered dictator prepared to speak to the nation from the presidential palace. He pledged immediate reforms, future elections within six months, according to one minister, and most significant of all, he promised he wouldn't stand again. But it wasn't enough to satisfy his increasingly emboldened critics. We want President Suharto to step down right now. We would like to have President Suharto, his family and his cronies to be put on trial immediately. Tell to your country, Suharto must die. Quite simply, for many of these students, President Suharto has not gone far enough. They remain sceptical that a man who's ruled this country with the iron grip of a dictator for more than three decades will suddenly relinquish power. It's not only radical students taking to the streets. The army was called to the stock exchange today when brokers walked out in protest at the president's announcement. This evening, student leaders met and decided that despite President Suharto's concessions, tomorrow's protests would go on. A decision endorsed by the leading opposition figure here. And they will uh, again and again and again stitch the demonstration, daily if necessary, until finally the old man uh, goes forever. The consequences can only be guessed at. Already the soldiers on the ground are nervous and uncertain. Never before have they been faced by a million or more of their own people determined to bring about change. Mark Austin, News at 10, Jakarta. Britain killed in last week's riots and looting was named today as Neil Peacock, who is 35 and from Northumberland. Other expatriates still in Indonesia were told by the Foreign Office today to get out as quickly as possible. Also reporting from Jakarta, his ITN's Colin Baker. The rush is on. It's time to go, say the Foreign Office. The President is still in power. A growing concern over what may happen tomorrow here in Jakarta means the British Embassy is now advising all expatriate British citizens to get out of Indonesia tonight. The escape from Indonesia almost brought the airport to a complete stop. Two hours minimum to pass through security, at least the same again to reach the check-in desks. Lost in the masses, 400 British citizens filling a British Airways jumbo bound for Kuala Lumpur before returning for the last time tonight to take anyone left. We're taking a good advice from the British Embassy and we're moving out, hopefully just for a few days while things cool down. On the streets, President Suharto's considerable military escort took him to an unknown destination, past the British Embassy, while inside, Ambassador Robin Christopher was briefing the Foreign Office in London on the deteriorating situation. One of my telegrams did say it was going to be a long night. Indeed. On the other end of the line, John Shepherd, Deputy Undersecretary, whose notes of this conversation would soon be passed to the Foreign Secretary and then Downing Street. Tomorrow could be quite difficult. I'm worried on two fronts. I'm worried about uh, the size of the student demonstration. However well-intentioned and peaceful the students may be, a million people, which is what they're talking about, possibly descending on Jakarta, is a lot of people to cope with, um, however well-intentioned. And we all hope and pray it goes off peacefully. We're advising British citizens that they should now leave Indonesia as soon as possible. On the embassy's first floor, offices have been converted to emergency rooms to warn expatriates of the possible dangers ahead.
John Robinson and his 13-year-old son Greg said goodbye to Sox, their puppy, this morning as they left for London. Their journey past the burnt-out buildings, past the tanks and armour on the streets, creating in them, like most of those leaving, uncertainty about what they'll find if they ever return. The last British evacuation flight has long gone, but at the airport here there are still thousands of other nationalities desperate to leave, desperate to find a flight that's going anywhere. Colin Baker, News at 10, Jakarta. The pressure on President Suharto of Indonesia grew today when the American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, effectively called on him to go. The planned million-strong demonstration against Suharto in Jakarta today was called off, but only because the army got tough and threatened a massacre. The opposition leader said that price would have been too high. Our Asia correspondent Mark Austin reports. Tonight in Jakarta, President Suharto's army removed the weapons of repression from the streets of a capital which, temporarily at least, can breathe easily again. All day it had been suffocated by an overwhelming military presence designed to prevent another humiliation for a dictator fast losing control. These streets should have been ringing to the sound of a million people protesting. But it wasn't so much the display of force that intimidated but rather the army's declared intention to use it. The protest leader, mobbed by students still occupying the parliament here, had been phoned by a general overnight and told the army didn't care if Indonesia had its own Tiananmen Square massacre. Preparing to address students, he told me that's why he'd called off the march. Not frightened, but I didn't want to sacrifice innocent people just to remove Suharto. It's too, too costly. Suharto is a cheap, uh, a cheap thing, you know. Outside, Amian Rais, who's put himself forward as a popular successor to Suharto, told the students to stay calm. The dictator's days are numbered, he said. But if the president of 30 years is looking for a graceful exit, these students want to drag him through the dirt. And some women protesters still wanted to take to the streets and confront the troops. Are you prepared to die for this? Yes. Why not? Because there are many people died already. This may be seen as something of a victory for President Suharto, but it's unlikely the momentum of these protests can be halted for long. All he has now is the loyalty of the army, a loyalty that's increasingly uncertain. Clearly at Parliament, some soldiers are siding with the students, and Jakarta's army commander said tonight they'd respect the protests there, calling it an institution of the people's sovereignty. And in other parts of the country, huge protests did go ahead today. Half a million people in one city. The pressure on Suharto to go and go soon is becoming relentless. Mark Austin, News at 10, Indonesia. Welcome back. Indonesians who forced President Suharto from power early today a play a split tonight on whether to give his successor B.J. Habibi a chance. Habibi was Suharto's vice president and a close ally and therefore associated with all the corruption of that regime. But today he promised reform and a cabinet of honest people. Reporting from Jakarta, here's our Asia correspondent Mark Austin. This has been an extraordinary day in Jakarta and tonight this country of more than 200 million people is entering a new era. An era without the man who's ruled here unchallenged for more than three decades. History will remember this as the day the voice of the people of Indonesia was finally heard. Suharto has ruled this country for longer than most of these students have been alive. But today, after 32 years, he's gone. This was their revolution, though at the moment they say, an incomplete one. The nation awoke to a sight unthinkable just a few days ago. In a halting voice, their president was broadcasting to the nation, saying he was sorry, begging forgiveness for his mistakes, and then announcing he was stepping down. On university campuses across the country, the scene for almost daily protests against Suharto, there was an explosion of joy. The same, too, in the parliament complex, occupied by the students for several days now. But the mood was soured by Suharto's last act as president. The handing over of power to his vice president, B.J. Habibi, a close friend of Suharto, hand-picked by him for the job, and a man tainted by the same allegations of corruption and cronyism. This, how do you call it, a puppet, you know, puppet. A puppet of Suharto. So what's the difference then? Tonight, Suharto's successor addressed the country. I watched with the main opposition leader here, Amian Rais, 
Afterwards, he said Habibi should be given three months to show he's committed to real reform. Would you call on the students to call off their protests now, to stop the protests? Yes, I think I will tell them that it is uh, now time to calm down and then to go back to the schools. Uh, uh, I mean, to go, to, the, to go back to the normal life, you know, and let's give Habibi a fair chance. Some Indonesians want to put Suharto and his billionaire children on trial for plundering the nation's wealth. But today, the army's top general vowed to protect the family, who this evening left the palace, evicted by their own people a humiliating end for a father of the nation who came to be despised. Tonight, President Habibi is a man who must prove himself to a skeptical nation, a man who must show he's committed to reform and not simply a clone of Suharto. Only then can stability return to a country that suffered so much turmoil. Mark Austin, News at 10, Jakarta. It was the student protests and subsequent disorder and bloodshed in Jakarta which brought President Suharto down. But the opposition to him was widespread. IDN's Colin Baker reports now from Surabaya, also on the island of Java, but 450 miles east of the capital. In his lifetime, he's seen presidents come and go, and his daily struggle for survival has never changed. In the east of Java, where a man can raise a family on 50 pence a day, because he has to, they know that change at the top will have little effect on those at the bottom. Their flag represents justice, equality and purity, fine principles few can afford and may only be appreciated by the next generation. In Surabaya, one hour after President Suharto stepped down, those who demonstrated said prayers and gave thanks for his demise. God is great, they say. But if there is a lack of over-jubilation, it's because these people are very much aware that the reforms they demand, some of them may never come. Like the use of force to suppress dissent, a new leader now, but for the armed forces who've bolstered the presidency for 53 years, old-star attitudes prevail. The students cannot parade in victory. Yesterday, uh -huh. uh, yeah, the yes. demonstrators and the students were shot at by these soldiers. Are they going to shoot at them today or are they going to go back to their barracks? We want peace, he said, not accidents. Outside the governor's office, the armed ranks were divided. Marine commandos in red berries had no objection to the students demonstrating inside the grounds. The infantry said no, and they won the argument. So across the road they celebrated. The hour belonged to those who'd held banners and held out. And hugs for friends who'd stood together with the hope that something other than the name on the door had changed. Colin Baker, News at 10, Saraboya, East Java. Indonesian troops moved into the parliament in Jakarta tonight to clear the complex of protesting students. Despite the fact that President Suharto was forced to stand down, the demonstrations have continued. The students suspect that the new president, B.J. Habibi, may not institute the reforms they are demanding. From Jakarta, here's our Asia correspondent, Mark Austin. It was just before midnight when the troops moved in, thousands of them, to end an occupation that's become an increasing embarrassment to the authorities here. They were armed with M16 rifles, batons and tear gas. They outnumbered the 2,000 students by four to one. A violent confrontation seemed inevitable. But for the Indonesian army, this was an operation carried out with extraordinary discipline. There were no shots fired and very few injuries. The new president clearly wants his parliament back, and tonight he's sending in thousands of troops to do it, and to do it by force. The students were marched out of the buildings at gunpoint as army commanders gave the orders to disperse. Student leaders told the protesters not to resist. The students took over the complex five days ago in a successful attempt to build pressure on President Suharto to resign. Once he had stepped down, they stayed on in protest of his successor, President Habibi, who they believe is little better than Suharto. Against such overwhelming force, the students had no choice but to leave peacefully. That's okay, they take the building, they got the weapon, they got the bullet. We're nothing but bringing our pen and book. We're just students, we are logic. We're not going to fight them because we're not going to win if they use the guns. The tension had been building earlier in the day when the parliament grounds had been the scene of angry clashes 
between the students and supporters of the new president. They'd entered the grounds in massive numbers and stormed the steps of the complex. It was the first time that such violence had broken out since the occupation began and almost certainly prompted tonight's operation. A short time ago, the students were put on buses brought in by the military. The occupation over, but said protest leaders, the demonstrations against the Habibi government would go on. Mark Austin, News at 10, Jakarta. An investigation's been launched.